to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ jesus said he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. We welcome you today to our study of the subject of baptism. Today specifically, we are thinking about what is baptism? What is the mode of baptism? In our modern world, people may think of baptism as sprinkling, as pouring, or as immersion. But in the scripture, what does the scripture teach is the proper and correct mode of baptism. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study together today. If you don't have your Bible handy, we'd like for you to pause for just a moment, locate that as we're going to look to the Word of God to answer these questions today. And friend, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to study more on the subject of baptism or any subject, you'll find people at the Lord's Church who'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you, and we encourage you to visit their assembly. You would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies, whether it be Sunday night, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday for Bible study, we'd encourage you to check out the Lord's Church in your area. And friend, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our previous lessons, we make those available to you free of charge. Just go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can fill out our media request form. And from there, you can access all our material. If you'd like to have a copy on DVD or CD or instantaneously as a digital download, We'll make that available to you free of charge. And in our fast-paced world where everyone has a smartphone, we encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app, available both in the Apple and Android stores, free of charge. We'd love for you to download that. You can keep up with our latest uh, lessons and what we're doing as well in that area. As we think today about the subject of baptism, there's a lot of confusion. And there are a lot of questions in people's minds on this subject. And so in this series of eight lessons, we're going to be thinking in detail about what the Bible says, our source. And the only source that we want to go to, mainly as we think about this, is the Word of God. The Bible says in Jeremiah 37 verse 17, Is there any word from the Lord? Or as Paul said in Romans 4, verse 3, what does the Scripture say? We're not going to ask what's popular or what does society think or what do the heads of religious organizations and religious leaders think today? We're just simply asking, what does the Bible say? What does God say on these subjects? And so in particular today, as we think about the idea of the mode of baptism, what is the proper mode of baptism? Friend, we want to submit today for you to think through the scriptures with us about that the idea of baptism being scripturally done by immersion, the only biblical mode of baptism is by immersion in the scripture. And, and I understand in our world, sometimes you may see somebody sprinkle a little water on people and call that baptism, or they may take a little cup full of water and pour it on someone, and that may be, in people's minds, baptism. What does the Bible say baptism is? And so we intend to offer three sources of evidence today to show what baptism is. The first and the major source, the most important source of all, is the Scripture. Can we look to the New Testament? Can we look to the Bible and find examples and, and showing us what the mode of baptism is? And we're going to submit four verses that we'd like for you to consider with us that clearly show 
In the New Testament, baptism was done by full body immersion. And then the second source we'll look at is the word baptism itself. We'll look into the language a little bit in which the Greek was written. And we'll notice that baptism, according to the language of the words that are used, also means full body immersion. And then as a third supplemental source of evidence, we will also look at church history. What did the church do very close to the writing of the New Testament and just a few years afterward? How did they see that? How did they look at baptism as well? And so we hope those sources of evidence today will help us to see what baptism actually is. As we emphasized, the major source of evidence Anytime we ask a Bible question, is the Scripture itself? Does the Bible give any details? Are there any passages? Are there any word pictures that help us to understand what baptism in the New Testament is? And friend, there are at least four passages in the New Testament that help us to understand the correct mode of baptism. And I'd like for you to take your New Testament and look along with us. The first is John chapter 3, verse number 23. In understanding how baptism was used in the New Testament, I want you to notice an example from the baptism of John. The Bible says, Now John also was baptizing in a non near Salim, listen to this, because there was much water there. Now friend, that little detail there, John was baptizing in this region around this certain locale because there was much water there. Well, what do I learn about this? I, I learned that John went to a specific place because of the amount of water. How much water does it take to sprinkle somebody? Well, just a few drops here and there. If, if baptism's by pouring, how much water does it take? Doesn't take a cup full or more, but to immerse a, a full-grown adult, how much water is required? Well, we would all say much water, a good amount of water. John specifically went somewhere where there was much water because the process and the mode of baptism requires that. And then I want you to think about another example. Open your Bible to Acts chapter 8 with me. This is the account of the Ethiopian eunuch. I want you to look in Acts chapter 8 and notice beginning in verse number 36. The Bible says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. Now watch this. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now think about what happens in this account as it's related to the mode of baptism. He's up in the chariot, teaching him the gospel. He learns what he needs to do. Hey, here's water. What hinders me? Your hindrance is you've got to believe. I believe. He makes that good confession. He stops the chariot. Now watch what happens. They both get out of the chariot. They both go down into the water. He baptizes him, and they come up out of the water. Now, friend, here's a man who is traveling from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia, and there is not a convenience store every two or three miles. Why do you have to get, don't you know they had water with them, likely? And if not, why did they both have to get out? Why couldn't Philip run and get a little water and sprinkle it on him or pour it on him? Why did they stop the chariot? Why did they both have to get out? Why did they both have to get in the water and come up out of the water? Again, all of that implies that baptism is immersion in the Bible. And then the third passage, which I think helps probably as much as any other passage. Open your Bible, if you would, to Mark chapter 1 with me. And the third source of evidence to help us understand what baptism is in the Bible is found at the baptism of Jesus. Look in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so a lot of people today are asking the question, what would Jesus do? And that's a great question for every area of life. What would Jesus do as it relates to the mode of baptism? Listen to it again. And immediately coming up out of the water, literal Greek word there is ek, which means out of. Immediately coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Now, friend, to come up out of water, what must you first do? Well, you first have to go down into water. And so when Jesus was baptized, that mode was immersion. He, he To come up out of, literally, ek, out of that water, he had to first go down into it. And so as I think about this passage, and as you study the language even a little more, Greek scholar uh, Kenneth Woos comments on Mark 1, 9 through 11, and he says this, clearly, immersion is in view here. In the next verse, ek, literally out, is used, literally out from within. And so it wasn't that J Jesus just came out of the body of water. It's as though he was engulfed in it and he came out from within the water. And so that picture again, Jesus was baptized into the river, then came up out of the water. A final passage. And in my estimation, it paints as clear a word picture as any that baptism in the New Testament was full body immersion. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6 with me, and I want you to notice verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now notice, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Friend, I want you to think about the, 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 the word picture the Holy Spirit paints here. We are buried with Christ in baptism. Baptism is likened unto a burial. There is a death. Dying to sin. There is a burial in water and there is a resurrection out of that to newness in life. But the word picture for baptism here is a burial. Now think about it for just a moment. The last time that you went to a, a, a graveside service. They take that body. There has been a hole dug in the ground. There is dirt on the bottom. There is dirt on every side around it. They place that body in the casket in that hole. Covered on the bottom, covered on every side. And then what do they do? Take a shovel full of dirt and sprinkle it on it? Pour a little on there? We realize they completely covered that body in the grave. It is immersed, engulfed, encased in the dirt. And friend, it was the same way in Jesus' day. They were encased in that tomb, whatever it may have been. And so when we think about this picture here, it is clear from the Bible, that baptism, according to the verses we've seen, is by full body immersion. So it says, well, what does, that, what does that really mean? What does that have to do with anything today? Friend, what it comes down to is, what does God authorize in the Bible? What examples do we see in the New Testament? Are we, are we going to follow the pattern that they followed as well? The scriptures teach whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of or by the authority of Jesus. Do we have biblical authority for sprinkling and pouring of water? We've definitely seen in the New Testament that we do for immersion. Now, let's talk about that second source of evidence and supplementary and only supplementary to what we've learned from the scripture. There's the testimony of of the Greek language. The majority of Greek lexicons and scholars will define our word for baptism, uh, which is a transliteration of baptizo, as to dip, to immerse, or to submerge. 
However, the most convincing evidence from Greek is the everyday usage of the word baptizo. If I can figure out how people in the first century, in the day of Jesus, use that word in its everyday definition, friend, that helps me to understand why the Holy Spirit chose that word, right? Greek scholar Marvin Vincent notes this example. He says that in classical Greek, the primary meaning is to immerse. And thus he gives this example. Polybius, in describing a naval battle between the Romans and the Carthaginians, says they sank. Now listen to this. Baptized. E baptizon, that is. They sank many of the Carthaginian ships. The word they used for the sinking of that ship, which we all realized it went fully under the water, is the word baptism. Greek scholar W.E. Vine says, Baptizo in the New Testament was used among the Greeks to signify the dyeing of a garment, the drawing of water by dipping a, a vessel into another. Plutarchus uses it of the drawing of wine by dipping the cup into the bowl. In every one of those, you've got the plunging of one item under the water and using it in that way. And so just as the word baptizo in the first century was used to mean sink or to dip, it's the same thing today. In fact, Catholic scholars have actually confessed this. They say fundamentalists are correct when they point out that the Greek word used in the New Testament for baptism is baptizo. And this means immersion or dunking. And so when we think about the idea there, the, the, the language clearly shows that's how it was intended to be used. But then, my friend, we also have the testimony of church history. And again, supplemental to the scripture and even supplemental to the language that we find the Bible was written in, there are some examples that do help us to understand the early church, closer to the writing of the New Testament, understood baptism to be by immersion. In fact, for the first three centuries after Christianity, there are not really any accounts of baptism uh, being sprinkling. For example, Tertullian, who was a second century Christian, he recorded this. He writes that baptism itself is a bodily act because we are immersed in water, but it has a spiritual effect because we are set free from sin. And so second century Christian, Tertullian. He recognized it was an immersing in water. Cyril of Jerusalem, a third century writer of church history says, he gives insight on the mode of baptism when he says, for as he who plunges into the water and is baptized is surrounded on all sides, all sides will be this way and up here and down here, every side, so were they also baptized completely by the Spirit. And so we understand Cyril's talking about uh, the baptism of the Spirit and what happened there. But he says it's just like water baptism, which means they're covered every side, all around top and bottom. That's a, a pretty clear picture of what baptism meant to people close to the first century. But then, friend, I want you to think about this idea. And I find this to be as striking as anything we think about. When we talk about the Greek words and church history and things like that, I want you to realize that in the New Testament language, there was a specific word for sprinkling and there was a totally different word for baptism. The Greeks had a word for sprinkling and it is rantizo. And it's actually used several times in the New Testament. Hebrews 9 verse 13, Hebrews 9 19, Hebrews 10 22 talks about the sprinkling of the blood of bulls and goats made for the offering. And so what's interesting is if the Greeks had a word, a specific word for sprinkling, and God chose to use the word baptizo for immersion. It's not as though God didn't know how to write it in such a way or didn't have an option to write it in such a way that he could have chosen that word. God chose a word that didn't mean sprinkling. It means immersion in the Bible. And so when we think about this, there's a lot of evidence that comes to light. And so 
As you think about church history, it all helps us also to understand another idea related to baptism's mode. Church history helps us to see that sprinkling actually became an accepted by the people then, substitute for immersion. From church history, we learn that there are two reasons why sprinkling began to be accepted. Sprinkling first began to be an option for uh, para paraplegic or bedridden people. First example of this takes us about to the middle of the third century to a man by the name of Novation. Uh, there, he, he was a man who was bedridden, and as a result, he was looking for a way to be baptized in his state. They didn't think they could get him in water and immerse him, and so people decided, not God, people decided that for this man, because of his situation, they could sprinkle him. Again, without Bible authority, they decided that. And from that time forward, it began to be substituted more and more and more. And so what we realize is, number one, that's not found in the Bible. That doesn't fit what we see in the original language. And people substituted that of their own, not because of God's asking. And then secondly, sprinkling was further accepted as a substitute for baptism uh, due to the doctrine of of original sin. And so as people get further away from the New Testament and the teaching of Scripture, we have this idea come along later that babies are born in sin, although the Scripture in multiple places teaches that God made them upright, that we don't inherit the sins of our Father, Ezekiel 18. This idea of babies being born in sin came a pro a co there's a conflict. You've got to see a uh, logical health conflict with baptism is full body immersion, babies are born in sin. And so if a baby's born in sin and whoever's in sin and doesn't receive, you know, contact the blood of Christ is going to be lost, then naturally first thing we want to do is get that baby baptized where he can be saved. How do you take a little one day, two day, three, old, three day old baby and immerse it under the water? Well, there's such a high risk, at least they thought of drowning them, that it became a substitute due to the doctrine of original sin. And of course, we don't find that doctrine taught in the Bible either. That's a doctrine of men, not something that we find taught by God. But friend, here's what we can know today. In the New Testament, the teaching of the Bible, according to scriptures we've looked at, John 3, 23, baptizing where there was much water. Acts chapter 8, they both, they stopped the chariot, both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, he baptized him. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, Jesus had to literally come up out of the water. And of course, to come out of that, you've got to go down into it, and then maybe the clearest picture of all. Romans 6, 1 through 4, Colossians 2, verse 12, baptism is a burial in water. A burial does not mean a little sprinkling of dirt. It does not mean a shovel full of dirt. A burial, burial is a full immersal, covered on the bottom on dirt, covered on every side by dirt, completely covered by the dirt, encased completely in the ground. And that's the picture we have in the Bible. And on top of that, all the, linguistic, all the linguistic evidence that you look at, from the word itself, meaning immersion, to the examples of the definitions in the first century, to, to, to the way the church history used that close to the time of Jesus, and the fact that there was a word for sprinkling, rantizo, and it's never once used to apply to baptism. Friend, that clearly shows us that in the Bible, baptism, the only acceptable mode we can find in the scriptures is full body immersion. To say that sprinkling, or to say that pouring, or to say that baptizing a, a baby and sprinkle a little water on its head, christening some will call it, that that's acceptable, you have to go beyond the Bible. And friend, the Bible cautions us against that. Second John 9 says, Whoever transgresses and goes beyond the scripture does not have God. Friend, if we're going to 
be what the church was in the first century. If we're going to be just simply Christians, nothing more and nothing less. We've got to realize that only in the New Testament do you find immersion only of people who were ready to be baptized. The problem with sprinkling, especially as it relates to a, a, a little baby, is when Philip was teaching the Ethiopian eunuch and he saw water in the distance and he said, hey, here's water, what hinders me? The hindrance was if you believe. Jesus said people had to repent, Luke 13, 3. You've got to make the good confession. Does a baby have the mental cognitive ability to really believe in Jesus? Can a baby repent and confess? Of course, we realize those things are not possible, and yet they are prerequisites to being baptized. And so, friend, we hope today that you'll consider the mode of baptism. And as you think about that, maybe you say to yourself, well, you know, I really wasn't baptized that way. Or maybe, maybe when I was young, I was sprinkled or had a little water poured on me, but I don't see that in the Bible, and I'd like to learn more about that. Friend, we'd be happy to talk to you. The church, the Lord's church in your area would love to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you on this idea. If you'd like to learn more about the subject of baptism, we encourage you to join us next time. And friend, as we think about this, the importance of it, if this were just a, a matter of frivolity, if this were just something that, you know, we're lackadaisical, we could approach anyway, it'd be a different idea. But here we're talking about contacting the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. We're talking about doing things the way God has asked us to, not the way man's asked us to. We're talking about who am I really trying to please. And so if you've never obeyed the gospel, we want to encourage you to do that. Again, if you'd like to know more about this or study more, please contact us and stay tuned next time as we're going to study more on the subject of baptism. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.